one guest, she's a good friend, and sort of the mastermind behind a lot of this. Jason Casper, CEO of Texas Precious Metals and Chief Investment Officer for the ARC Fund Capital Management Group. Prior to his current responsibilities, Jason was a Chief Investment Officer at Gunamis Capital, as well as holding numerous investment positions within the finance industry. Jason is the author of numerous articles regarding economic conditions and has been syndicated on many websites such as businessinsider.com. Please join me in welcoming my good friend, Mr. Jason Casper. Oh, that was quite the introduction, I'm used to that. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to close out the Dallas Precious Metal Seminar. Uh, there's definitely been some incredible insight from all the various speakers involved. And, you know, my focus is primarily going to be go on the gold market. That's where I will be um, uh, talking about. My talk is entitled Gold and its Place in the Current Monetary World. And I think many investors, both individuals and institutions, really don't have a good framework by which to evaluate gold ownership. And so hopefully I can provide a framework or at least something to consider uh, when looking to buy gold, sell gold, et cetera. First, you know, I run a hedge fund, so I have a lot more uh, legal restraints, so I've got to provide this slide and claim that basically I don't know anything. Um, I'm talking about the ARC fund doesn't really exist, and basically stop listening to me. So. <laughs> um, Second, after legal, is basically a quick note about ARC Fund Capital Management and a little bit about who we are. The ARC Fund is structured as a hedge fund, meaning that we can only take investors who are accredited or have high net worth individuals. Uh, we are a fund who manages a gold, gold portfolio um, as it relates to a thesis of real deflation. So basically, we believe that whether gold goes up or goes down um, as a result of government manipulation, that things, cars, homes, stocks, will continue to get cheaper uh, in gold terms, so that the stock market, even if it goes up, gets cheaper in real terms, or we're deflating in real terms, if you will. Um, furthermore, besides using gold as an investment tool, or as this real deflation bet, we've also figured out a way to turn uh, the gold holdings into something that generates a dividend stream, or an income stream. You know, what the problem with gold in general is, it sits there, just like a dollar bill would. Well, for our investors, through our sister company, Texas Precious Metals, the earnings of Texas First Metals flow as a dividend stream, if you will, back to our investors, which is sort of a unique um, uh, uh, thesis or a unique uh, construct within uh, the hedge fund. And then as a result of taking physical possession of gold, to my knowledge, we're the only investment fund in the United States and in the world who can also redeem it in gold. So you can redeem in dollars, or if you want to redeem in gold eagles, after the investment is done, you're uh, allowed to do that as well. We have three basic uh, types of investors. The first are those who strongly agree with our thesis of real deflation. They're typically have been investors their entire lives. Um, they understand finance. They dig down into it, and they uh, and they generally uh, know or understand our thesis and want to be a part of it. The second type of investor are those who are really not investors. They've been in the professional world. They're executives of uh, companies. They're doctors. They're lawyers. They're, um, uh, they've made their wealth uh, outside of investing and, and don't really understand the whole investing thing. They see the world and they're nervous and they put say 5% of their portfolio or 10% of their portfolio, whatever the number is with us and hope that we're wrong. They hope their investment loses money because if we're losing money, then hypothetically the world itself is doing okay, their job is fine, their investment returns uh, elsewhere are doing okay. And then the third type of uh, investor uh, who invests with us is those investors who already have a huge gold portfolio. Um, they've owned gold, precious metals for years, um, and they like the diversification that the ARC fund provides. So how do you diversify gold? I mean, gold is gold, right? You can't really diversify it. Well, an investment in the ARC fund represents a physical possession in gold uh, as part of a construct of a uh, broader investment strategy. And so we may make money, we're correlated with gold, but we may make money if gold goes up, we may even lose money, or we may make money if gold goes down, or we may lose money. So it provides some diversification of the overall gold holdings. Um, oops, didn't switch. So looking at gold, and I, you know, we look at gold as a currency, uh, gold being the ultimate currency. And there's been a lot, you know, I've been listening to a lot of these talks and everyone's been talking about history. I'm like, wow, we're getting a, 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 a everyone's a history major, not really investors. And I, I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, gold history 
because uh, I'm a big believer in Mark Twain's quote, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And so to understand gold, one must understand the history of gold. And so since monetary history began, you could say that's been 5,000 years, it has been some form of currency. And it's believed that the Egyptians in 4,000 BC were the first to sort of cast gold bars and gold coins, uh, uh, gold bars and set the ratio between gold and silver. And then it was 700 BC when the Lydians produced their first gold coins. Um, and in the United States, gold was a form of currency until August 15, 1971, when President Nixon took America off the gold standard. So think about it from this perspective a little bit. I think this has some perspective. Divide monetary history, 5,000 years, into a football field. Every 50 years is one yard. So we have 100 yards, and every 50 years is one yard. The United States, or current monetary system, has not used gold now for about 40 years. That didn't even make it to the one yard line. So if you're looking and, and looking at all of monetary history, it is my belief that gold and silver uh, in some form or capacity will revert back to its sort of currency status. And I think the market is already doing that. If you look at how gold is trading, it's trading as a currency, not necessarily as a commodity. So, you know, I get um, uh, asked a lot, you know, where does gold go? And I think, you know, I, I talk about gold as a currency. I think most of us in here would at least sort of you know, say, oh, I thought about that, or yeah, go, I understand, go, some of a currency, you know, but, and so what? And the reason I think that is so important is because I think it drastically changes how you think about gold. You know, if gold uh, is, a, you know, most of us think about gold as investment, I and mean, that's how CNBC talks about it, all the talking heads, you know, a lot of investors and traders are talking about gold as an investment. No, I don't think gold is an investment, and to consider it so, I think really, puts you in a dangerous financial situation when evaluating your exit points. Gold is a form of savings. You know, I choose to save dollars, or I choose to spend dollars. In the same way I choose to save in gold, or I choose to spend in gold. You know, this is critical, I think, to understanding the gold market. Critical. In principle, you know, if not in practice, gold investors are placing gold into a savings account where it will be invested eventually. In essence, again, gold and the U.S. dollar are both currencies, medium of exchanges. I know several families who diversify their savings. They have some British pounds, they have some euros, they have some Japanese yen, they have some dollars, and they have some gold. It is just a part of their currency diversification for savings. So if gold is an investment, then you're worried about what price to sell it at. You know, using U.S. dollars, should I sell gold when it goes to $1,800 an ounce? Or maybe when it goes to $2,500 an ounce? That's when I should sell it. Oh my gosh, you know, what if gold goes to $700 an ounce? Should I sell it, you know, do I need to get out of it? You know, gold as a currency really changes that discussion. If I put $10,000 under a mattress, that is 100 $100 bills, and I wait 10 years, how many $100 bills will I have? I'll still have 100. If I put five ounces of gold under a mattress, and wait 10 years, how many ounces of gold will I have? Five. Neither is really working as an investment. So we all need savings, and, go, and, and I would say both are a form of savings. We need savings for when there's investment opportunities. You know, if a certain asset price drops and we want to then spend gold to buy that. Um, if we lose our job or a disaster happens in our own life. You know, savings are vital to a healthy financial situation. So the question becomes, what to save in? And it is my opinion that gold should always be at least a portion, at least a small portion of one's savings. So as part of the rest of my talk uh, framework, I'm going to give you two reasons why to own gold, or why to save in gold, and then uh, a risk, I would say, to gold ownership on the price level in the short term, in intermediate term. Gold e re owning reason number one, a system reset. Uh, Mark Faber, who uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with, he was on Bloomberg News recently, and uh, he said, if you really think it through, and you think the whole system will collapse, and we don't know if it is in three years, or five years, or ten years, but one day there will be a reset, and eventually everything will be started anew. Gold, more than any other asset, is the ultimate reserve currency for a system reset. If you read Mark Faber's statement, most financial media types would call that shocking, you know, or a bold statement. And I'd say, not at all. There will be a reset at some point. These occur regularly throughout history. We just live through a short, finite lives. I read somewhere that uh, each, every individual born has about a one 
in four to one in three chance of living through a system reset. The longest running financial system in history was the Byz Byzantine economic system in the Ottoman Empire, and they had the Byzantine gold coin. It has been called the dollar of the Middle Ages. It lasted 900 years. It eventually also collapsed. So every system has collapsed and reset. In the United States, we've actually had two collapses slash resets. One of them was the Articles of Confederation, and the second was right here in Texas, the Confederacy after the Civil War, and the Confederacy after the Confederacy lost the Civil War. You know, the reset after the Articles of Confederation was a partial reset. Um, a complete collapse occurred on U.S. soil following the resolution of the Civil War. And one of my favorite stories in this, and I've written about it before, is that of Edward Steves out of San Antonio. Steves immigrated to the United States in 1849 from Germany. He ventured into the Texas Hill Country as a farmer with mediocre success as he battled unpredictable weather, you know, uh, threats of local Indians in rocky, rocky soil. He scraped every penny he had and took a huge entrepreneurial leap in the early 1861. He spent his entire savings on a newly invented machine, the first mechanical combine uh, to ever reach the shores of Texas. By chance, it made it on the last ship into the Port of Galveston before the Port of Galveston was blocked off for the rest of the Civil War. So once he got it into the San Antonio area, he basically had a monopoly uh, for the farmers in, in the area. The farmers wanted to pay him in Confederate dollars. He refused to pay him in Confederate dollars and said, I'll take payment in kind. So whatever portion you know that his combine would uh, uh, take, uh, he would take a portion of that and then set off to Mexico regularly, selling it for gold and silver. Uh, this occurred for several years until the Civil War ended. The Federal Confederacy collapsed along with the entire monetary system. Confederate dollars and Confederate bonds became worthless, sending many uh, individuals and institutions into financial ruin. The end of the Galveston blockade marked the death of his monopoly. By that time, he had amassed a fortune in gold and silver. So what did he do? And what does gold allow you to do? He bought back into a, work of system, a working system. He took his gold and bought Union dollars uh, and launched in 1866 a lumber company that by 1916 had become the largest millwork in the entire Southwest of the United States. Today, it still exists in San Antonio as Steve's and Sons offering more than 300,000 variations of doors throughout the United States. And I think this Edward Steve story illustrates a, par a great illustrative parable of how to build and reserve wealth when in economic systems are in flux. So this is number, number, reason number one to own gold. It acts as a system hedge. There's nothing else that you buy that guarantees you a standard of living that you are previously accustomed to. It acts as insurance. And similar to fire insurance in your home, you hope you never have to use it. Unlike fire insurance, even if everything is going great, gold does not have an expiration date, and the insurance policy never goes to zero. Ten years ago, I would have, I would have stood up here and said, I'd argue with you, that the chances of the economic, American's economic system collapsing was zero over the next ten years. Today, I will not make the same argument. You know, you and me may argue, oh, the chance of a complete economic collapse is two percent. Or maybe I think it's 20%, or maybe you think it's 60%, but it's no longer zero. And so as a result, regardless of where the price of gold goes, you know, whether it goes to $3,000 an ounce or back to down to $500 an ounce, it's a form of savings in a rainy day in case that rainy day turns into a flood. Gold re owning reason number two is a form of savings priced <clears throat> against another asset. And this is the era, investment area where the ARC fund focuses on. Holding gold against another asset class so that one that gold is one leg of the overall investment, st investment strategy. If you view gold as a currency, then other asset prices move around in relation to gold, just like they move around in relation to dollars. So gold becomes expensive or cheap in relation to other assets. So you want to save in gold when the assets are really expensive in relation to gold, and you want to spend gold buying other assets when these assets become cheap in relation to gold. At the ARC Fund, we are specifically focused on the Dow-Gold ratio. So you take the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and you divide it by the price of gold. 
The Federal Reserve has spent trillions in the last few years distorting market prices and preventing the market from collapsing. However, during this time, the market has continually become cheaper in gold terms. It is our belief that the Fed can control nominal prices to some degree. If they want the Dow Jones to go to, to, to 20,000. They potentially have that if they print enough money. But they can't control it in gold terms or in real terms. The market has slowly grinded lower in gold terms. We call this deflation in real terms or real deflation. The market, and hence the productive cap capacity of gold terms, hits trough valuations as it relates to gold when the Dow Jones ratio hits a 2 to 1 or even a 1 to 1 ratio. This has occurred twice in the last 100 years, both times in very, very different economic situations. The first time was in 1932 during the Depression. Dow to gold hit a 1.9 to 1 ratio. The second time was in 1981. Dow to gold hit a 1.1 to 1 ratio. These were two totally different economic environments. Think about it. 1932, you had depression, deflation, asset prices were dropping everywhere. 1981 was totally opposite. You had inflation or stagflation. Dow Jones, when priced against gold, real economic value hit a trough valuation in both economic scenarios. Today, the ratio is around eight. Um, and that eight is, not terribly expensive, it's been much higher, uh, but the long-term average is around six, but it's nowhere near close to a trough valuation. And we believe that in the next three, five years, our thesis is that we will hit that trough valuation of two to one or even a one to one ratio. Hence, we want to own gold, and this is like what the ARC Fund does, we want to own gold against the market. We're using gold as our currency and shorting the market against it. And when that occurs, you know, if we hit that two to one to one to one ratio, we still want to have our little sliver uh, for that we always will own in gold. But at that time, we'll start selling gold to buy the market because we'll think gold, the market in gold terms, has become cheap on a valuation basis. And here, as you can slide, you can see the 1932 bottom and the 1981 bottom. And currently, like I said, we're about 8x. Gold is not cheap compared to all assets right now. In fact, compared to some assets, it's getting somewhat expensive. This chart was from last September when gold was peaking. It shows the price of, gold, uh, price of a home, an average median home in America, priced in gold terms. Using gold as a currency, homes were reaching its lowest level not seen since 1981. In early September, we approached this bottom, which was around 88.7 ounces that could buy an average American home. Um, and you know now it becomes at least interesting to consider spending gold, if you have a huge savings gold, spending gold to buy real estate. Because if, as a currency, gold is cheap to real estate. Not to say that it can't go much lower. It could easily do if the whole entire economic system to collapse. I'm just trying to create a framework by which to evaluate how much your portfolio is in gold or should be in gold. So to recap, you have two reasons to own gold and savings. One should be in case of a system reset. This base, in my opinion, should never be touched, except in an absolute emergency. And then you have the second bucket that is a form of savings when investment opportunities are few. Holding gold against another asset and planning to buy some asset in the future. The second bucket doesn't really matter what the price of gold is in dollar terms. You should not care if gold goes to $2,000 an ounce in dollar terms or $1,000 an ounce in, in, in uh, dollar terms. I'll repeat that, just because I think it's so important to change the psychological framework by which you evaluate gold. It doesn't matter whether gold goes to $1,000 an ounce or $2,000 an ounce. All you care about is gold in relation to the assets that you're looking to buy or when you're looking to invest. So the price in dollars becomes irrelevant. You're comparing two currencies. I want to talk a little bit about the downside risk of gold just for a few minutes. And I want to do this for a couple reasons. First, I have been to many conferences sort of like this where I feel like the intellectual honesty sort of goes out the window. One needs to understand the argument against your favorite investment or your thesis to be a good investor. And hopefully I can add some value as someone who owns a lot of gold and is very deeply interested in gold while explaining some of the risks in the short term, the intermediate term of the gold price. Secondly, and I would say this is even more important, is that one needs to understand the variables so that if something moves against you, if gold does go down to, in dollar terms, $800 an ounce or $1,200 an ounce, you can reevaluate, be prepared psychologically 
so that you're not like most other Americans who buy at the top and sell at the bottom. When I hear people who like gold uh, and, and buy a lot of gold uh, and converse with them, I feel like there's very little understanding of the system itself. There's lack of understanding of how basic assets and liabilities work within the system. Uh, really what even how quantitative easing works. I mean, we've printed trillions and people have been calling now this hyperinflation since 2009 when it all started. Why hasn't it occurred? And really digging into it I would, would be a full day seminar in itself um, and be really complicated. So let's just try to understand on a high level how it relates using a real life example that probably all of us in this room can relate to. Imagine you're an average American who's bought an average American home valued at $180,000. Now imagine that you put 10% down and have a 30 year mortgage payment at a fixed 4% rate. Your monthly mortgage payment would be $1,197.54. Not euros, not gold, not yen, but dollars. Every month you must pay $1,197 and 54 cents every month. Your liability is in dollars. Every month, you're creating demand for dollars. Pretend now that you see what the Fed is doing. You think America is headed down the wrong path. You don't like the dollars. You don't want to own other currencies. You want to buy gold. But, well, you still need $1,197.54 every month in dollars. That reality has profound implications for other asset prices like gold and for the dollar. So take your example, the average American with the average mortgage, multiply it by hundreds of million people whose liabilities are in dollars. Now take that number and multiply it by billions of people in the, in the world as a result of the dollar being the reserve currency. As a result, when things start looking really, really bad, the demand, the demand for dollars isn't what I would call a flight to safety, as you hear say on CNBC, but a flight for liquidity for those individuals, companies, banks, who have liabilities in dollars to ensure they have the dollars to meet the liabilities. So another great example of this was the 1930s deleveraging depression. What happened in, what, what was the dollar in 1930? Dollar was gold, gold was dollar. During the Great Depression, there was a mad scramble for dollars, and hence there was a mad scramble for gold. If you had a mortgage in 1932, your $1,197.54, you had to have gold to pay that off. You know, now you have to have dollars. That's the way the system is created. And people don't think about how the framework and that works. And so as a result, you know, when you hit, hit these deleveraging air pockets and things look really bleak, gold goes down because banks and everyone else has to sell gold to meet their liabilities in dollars. Like, and this isn't the case for today. So this, is Lehman Brothers in 2008. This, uh, down here runs from about September 10, 2008 to uh, mid-October. Shows the bottom trailing down is SPY, or S&P 500, and the uh, uh, gold one is GLD, or gold. After Lehman, the market collapsed 30% in less than two months. Gold went down, and if you went down a little bit further, went peaked down about 9% from the time uh, Lehman Brothers ha happened. How in the world did gold go down? I mean, think about it. The entire system was close to collapse. You had bank runs occurring in California. You had money markets breaking the buck. If there was ever a reason in the history of mankind or history of the United States to own gold, you know, that was it. So how in the world did gold go down? Well, the reason, and it's a risk today, I think, in the short to intermediate term, is a scramble li liquidity to meet debt obligations and margin calls. Even if you hated dollars, if you had liabilities in dollars, you had to have dollars. And so as a result, it's not that, I would argue that this chart shows that gold didn't go down. In fact, it went up in relation to the stock market. Stock market went down 30%, gold down, went down nine. So in, you could buy more assets with your gold. It's just the dollar actually went up even more than gold because the liabilities were in dollars. Another modern day example is the, ja is the J Japan situation. And their system is the closest structured economic system. England, the United States, and um, uh, Japan has the closest framework uh, compared to any other uh, framework of monetary system. And this is over the last 10 years. If you know anything about Japan, very much 
worse debt situation than we are. Okay, this chart is inverted um, in the sense that this is comparing it to the U.S. dollar. So as you see the chart go down, that is actually yen strengthening for the last 10 years. How is that possible? Japan's situation is horrible. Their financial system, they have massive amounts of debt. Well, every year that debt has to be rolled in yen terms. Um, and so every, it's creating this artificial demand for yen. Now, investors like Kyle Bass, if you're familiar with him, he is betting that uh, Japan is reaching the Keynesian endpoint. And this last, if you look at that spike, it's not getting much um, uh, uh, press coverage in the financial media, but I'm watching that like a hawk right now because if that really starts going, that means Japan has reached their Keynesian endpoint and Japan is very, very close to collapse. And so I've always said that deflation will lead to inflation. And Japan, I think, is a great example where their system creates an artificial demand for a currency that is flawed uh, and they've been deflating for 20 years and once they reach this Keynesian endpoint, it will turn very, very quickly from inflation to a hyperinflation scenario. So understanding our system is very important, I think, in evaluating gold and silver and other asset prices. Despite being a gold investor, I tend to think that the odds are high for another deflationary wave. And like I just said, I think like to say that deflation will lead to inflation. If that scenario occurs, gold could easily go down against the US dollar, and I think the stock market will go down a lot more, at least in the short term. So gold is actually going up, but the demand for dollars to be liabilities is just going up faster. So you really need to understand gold as a currency, not to respond incorrectly in an emotional level when, if it starts declining in US dollar terms during that time frame. And you know, maybe none of this is relevant. Maybe uh, the United States is about to start hyperinflating. That's definitely a possibility. I personally think that's fairly unlikely in the very, very short term. Uh, and that's an entirely different presentation and I can talk about why that I don't, I don't see inflate, hyperinflating in the very, very short term, but it is possible. And the main thing though I want to, I hope that you've received from this talk is one, how to look at gold as a currency in the form of a currency. Two, why you should own gold. And then three, sort of the downside risk of gold in the short term, that if gold does take a, you know, gold can move fairly violently here, how to react um, on an emotional level. And with that, I will end. And uh, I don't know if we have any, what time is it? Time for questions? Yeah, you have a few questions. I got about uh, five to 10 minutes of questions before we have to vacate the room. So you're seeing, you believe that you're gonna have deflation first, for some period of time, and then you're gonna have yeah. inflation leading to whatever your definition of potential hyperinflation is. Right, right. So I've been a big deflationist pretty much since about 05, 06. If you look at monetary history, um, as far as the way our system is structured, Weimar, and I can get into this later, maybe outside, Weimar Republic was structured much, much differently than in their monetary system than the United States monetary system. So in the Weimar Republic, if, if a government went and, and built uh, a bridge, they just printed the money and gave the money to the bridge maker. There was no loan or liability on the other side. Even though the Fed is just creating money out of thin air, there's still liability on the other side. In the sense that the US government builds a bridge as a stimulus activity, and they're selling treasuries. And so the actual liability is increasing. So that's a very much different framework than the, the, than the Weimar Republic. And the same thing uh, in Japan. And so eventually we'll hit that what's called Keynesian endpoint and we'll hyperinflate. Um, that's why though we moved to, I've moved instead of debating, debating uh, investing just pure deflation because I was tired of losing on the stock market because it just went up and up and up, uh, betting on real deflation. Because uh, even if, if I'm wrong, and maybe we don't, you know, maybe the Dow Jones doesn't go to 5,000. Um, uh, in gold terms, quantitative, uh, QE1, QE2, uh, when the, when the Fed does this, um, we're still having this real deflation. So gold price in Dow Jones has continued to decline, and so it really takes the trillion dollar question out of it. I really don't care if I'm 100% right and the Dow does go to 5,000, maybe it goes to 20,000 and gold goes to 10,000. I still make money and hit that two to one ratio. So if that's your proposition, that's your understanding, what, what is your investment mix today? As far as, uh, as, far the, as uh, the ARC fund or as far as the person? The, uh, both. Well, the ARC fund is, is an investment structure and we have mandates. So 50% of the portfolio always has to be in gold. That's a requirement 
buyer legally, buyer paid for. Um, and then of that 50%, we have to be at least 50% short a major market index, the S&P 500, to put on the bet. So uh, just imagine the ARC Fund's total value is worth $10. We have $5 in gold, minimum, and we have to have minimum of 250 short against the market. We can be up to $5, and we are currently. So we have basically $5 long gold, $5 short the market. So that's how the ARC Fund is structured on a portfolio basis. Um, personally, um, I'm structured more where, uh, so I have, a, I have a very large investment in the ARC Fund, uh, and so that sort of represents my gold holdings. But then I'm, you know, I'm not here to get necessarily give investment advice on portfolios, but I'm, I'm about 30% cash, uh, 20 to 30% precious metals as a form of savings, uh, and then 30 to 40% defensive equities. And even in the high, if you look at the Weimar Republic, even in a hyperinflation scenario, you know, the stock market could close. That's a risk, so you lose your liquidity. But if you have a right to the ownership of the company, what survived during the Weimar Republic? The only thing that survived during the Weimar Republic was some major uh, German multinational companies. And so I believe that even if our system completely collapses, someone like Coca-Cola will still exist 30 years from now. The stock, you may not be able to sell it for a period of time, or the stock may plummet you know, for a period of time, but it will still exist, just like gold will still exist. So that, that seems very similar to, to, to Mark Faber's uh, piece, I, other than foreign, Asian. Right, Mark Faber believes, uh, I think, more strongly in the inflation occurring quicker. I'm, like I said, more on, in the deflation camp, but I mean, the art fund, that's why we created it. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. It's a trillion, it's been the trillion, I worked on Wall Street um, uh, for a stint, and, it's, and right now, a lot of friends there, it's a trillion dollar question. You know, inflation from a portfolio management standpoint, inflation or deflation, compose your portfolio massively differently. And so, you know, in my opinion, I don't really care in nominal terms if I can create a strategy in real terms that it doesn't it doesn't affect it. So the simplistic approach would be half gold, half cash. Uh that would yes, agreed. Awesome. Well I appreciate you guys coming to the uh, uh, Dallas Precious Metal Seminar. I hope that you gained at least a few nuggets and uh, Tark and I work together um, closely and if you have any questions related to you know overall investment prognosis or uh, 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 gold silver we'd be happy to help you and, and pass along any other questions you may have for David Morgan's the Jet algorithm. Also if you need any 